Thank you very much. And I want to thank the New Hampshire Humanities that funds so many of these programs. So my name is Liz Tenterelli, and I am president of the League of Women Voters with New Hampshire. In 2019, when we were all anticipating the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote, the League was also anticipating its 100th anniversary because we are a direct outgrowth of the suffrage organization. So I said, of course, I will put together a slideshow about this for the New Hampshire Humanities, and that's what you're going to see. Well, little did we know in 2019 you know, yeah. what was going to happen yeah. to all our centennial plans. But, you know, better late than never. So 2020 was the centennial of women getting the right to vote, and I will be talking about that tonight. But I want to make the point that what women were doing was not merely fighting for the right to vote, but they were fighting for a broader kind of civil rights for themselves and for others in society and learning to use their civic voices. The vote is the tangible thing that we're all so aware of, but we'll see in this that there is a bigger picture. So many of you have heard the famous phrase that Abigail Adams used in a letter to John Adams when he was at the Constitutional Convention. Remember the ladies? <laughs> you know, we, we nudge our husbands when this is important, but I'm going to read a little bit more of that statement. Abigail writes to John, 1776, do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. Apologies <laughs> to them for they sitting here. <laughs> if particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. Recording in progress. So it's a lot more than just that phrase we know. So let's think about where this all started. And we have to go back to the 1820s and 30s when many women, as well as men, of course, were part of the abolition movement trying to get rid of slavery. Two of the female abolitionists were the Grimke sisters from South Carolina. Now imagine speaking out against slavery in South Carolina in the 1820s and 30s. And when they tried to do this, they were shushed. They were said, women cannot speak in public. Your voice it has no meaning. It, it shall not be heard. And they came to realize that it wasn't just the slaves whose rights were being infringed upon, but their rights simply because they were women. Now, two women whose names may be familiar, going back to 11th grade history, are Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. They started out also as abolitionists, and they first met each other in 1840 at an international convention in London. In this country, they've been active in the abolition movement. They thought when they got there that they would have a role in the decisions made. No, they were told, go sit up in the gallery, ladies, and we don't want to hear from you. And that's how they met. And I can imagine them nudging each other, saying, wait till we get back to the U.S. We'll take care of this. <laughs> now, the photos we have of these women are of their mature years, shall we say. They were young women in 1840 when they met. In fact, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her husband were there on their honeymoon. So it took eight years before they were able to take action. But in 1848, the Women's Rights Convention, the first ever in this country, was held in Elizabeth Cady Stanton's hometown in upstate New York, Seneca Falls. 300 people came, and they, dra they had drafted a, a document, these sentiments and resolutions that included 11 things that women wanted. Now, these sound like civil rights if I start talking about them. They wanted access to higher education. At that time, only one college would accept women. They wanted access to the professions to become doctors and lawyers and, and university professors. 
They wanted the rights to their own income rather than it automatically becoming the husband's or the father's income. They wanted rights over their children. The men had the rights of saying, you know, what, what would happen with the children, where they would go and so on. So there were 11 of these civil rights that were included in this document. But then Elizabeth Cady Stanton added the 12th, and that was the right to vote. Well, when that came up, <laughs> when she first said it, by the way, her husband, who up until then had been a pretty supportive guy, said, you can't do that, Elizabeth, and he left town. <laughs> and, and yeah, coward. Anyway, <laughs> they held the convention. And when they started discussing that, it, it, the others had passed unanimously. It looked like this was not going to until Frederick Douglass and Elizabeth Cady Stanton made this huge plea that the reason you need the right to vote is that that right is so fundamental. It's the way you will gain the other rights. Mm -hmm. And that is what we date the call for women's suffrage to 1848. That was the first public declaration of it. Now, where did these women in upstate New York ever get this uppity idea that they should have equal rights with men? <laughs> yeah, really. They got it from their neighbors, the Haudenosaunee. This is also called the Iroquois Confederacy. This was uh, six Native American tribes living in New York and Canada, uh, in which the women had extremely powerful roles and rights. For instance, they they kind of held the primary for the selection of the chiefs, and then the men would vote, vote from there. Um, they had a voice in whether the tribe would go to war or not. The Senecas, it took a, a vote of three quarters of the mothers to establish a peace treaty. They owned the property. It wasn't the men. If uh, a husband died, I'm sorry, if a wife died, the children would go to her family to be raised, not to the husband's family. Uh, you know, her brother would be the man in charge, for instance. So the white women, including Matilda Jocelyn Gage, who was, you know, very uh, involved with, with the uh, Haudenosaunee and the convention, said, we want what they've got. So that's where we're looking at these rights, including the right to vote. Now, the famous name that you all know is Susan B. Anthony. She was not at that first convention, but she did go to the one in 1851. So these started developing in different parts of the country and in, uh, you know, every year something is held. When they met, again, we see them as mature women. When they met as young women, they committed their lives to women's suffrage and worked on that until both of them passed away. Before the federal amendment came in, of course, they would have been in their 80s, well into their 80s or 90s by then. Sojourner Truth, the former slave, attended the 1851 convention and gave her famous Ain't I a Woman speech. There were Black women involved in the suffrage movement right from the early, early days. Uh, and Sojourner Truth was one of them. So let's think about what, what's going on. I said they wanted these basic civil rights. They were fighting for those in the states, particularly the northern state. Uh, their own wages, oh, the right to own property. Uh, that was an important one. You know, about the only way a woman could own property was to be a wealthy widow with no son. And then she could inherit her husband's property. Uh, divorce laws and so on. But did you know that in the very early days of our country, women actually had the right to vote? There was nothing that said they couldn't in the Constitution. The word male was not in there defining a voter. Does that mean that women voted? Well, not really, because those were the days when a, a voter had to own property and pay taxes. <laughs> and now you see the hitch, women couldn't own property. So only those wealthy widows, as I said, might have voted. And there was one in Massachusetts, very, very wealthy, very famous. She was a ruling force in her town and she voted. But gradually the states wrote women out of the constitutions and they started adding the word male in defining voters. 
uh, you know, in 1784, that happened in New Hampshire. The women were inspired not only by uh, Abigail Adams' statement, but by everything else that was going on to say taxation without representation is wrong. We did that in the revolution, it's wrong now. Lucy Stone in New Jersey actually owned some property. I'm not sure how that happened, but she did. And she refused to pay her taxes because taxation without representation is wrong. So the authorities took her tables and chairs to sell at auction. And then a friend of mine found out and told me that the neighbors thought this was wrong, so they bought the tables and chairs back. <laughs> <laughs> But the women were coming up with all kinds of reasons to vote, and they were, of course, being denied. And then the Civil War occurred. Because most of these women had been abolitionists first, they put aside their own interests for voting in civil rights in order to fight for the abolition of slavery. And because the, about the only legal right procedure that women had access to was signing petitions, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and others started circulating petitions in favor of the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery. And they gathered 400,000 signatures across the country, a large number at that time. So the 13th Amendment passed, abolished slavery. Then the 14th Amendment was drafted because that's the Equal Protection of the Law Amendment, and it was going to apply to freed slaves as well. And the women said, wait, it'll apply to us, right? These equal rights of citizenship, we're citizens, we should be able to vote. They tried to use that argument in court. It was shot down all the way up to the Supreme Court. It was shot down. No, that's not what it means. Then we come to the 15th Amendment. What's happened so far is that Blacks have been free. They've got some citizenship rights, but they don't quite have the right to vote. So the 15th Amendment was going to grant freed Blacks the right to vote, but only the men. And this caused that real split. Um, first, we've got people arguing for universal suffrage, you know, think of this 15th Amendment as a way to get voting rights for all, get rid of the property requirements, let women vote, let the former slaves, male and female vote. And this was a huge organization, black and white men and women. Well, it didn't work out that way. The way the uh, amendment was drafted it turned out only the men were going to get the right to vote. And there was a split in the women's movement. Lucy Stone, Frederick Douglass, and others used the famous line, this is the Negro's hour. After going through slavery and now being freed and trying to establish economic independence, the, at least the men needed the vote. Let's pass it that way. Elizabeth Cady Sand, Susan B. Anthony, and others said, if we don't do it now, it'll be decades before women get the right to vote. So they were right. But that caused a split that was not healed until 1890 between these two aspects of the suffrage movement. Now I'm going to leave suffrage aside and talk about what else was happening in society. And the big thing was that all the farm girls from here, from here we're going down to Lawrence and Lowell to work in the mills because anything was better than working on the farms here, frankly, <laughs> in the minds of these girls. They were getting some independence. They were working in very tough conditions, unsafe, long hours, six days a week for pennies, but they did it. They went there in droves. In 1828, the first strike organized by women occurred in a textile factory in Dover, New Hampshire. Uh, it was the Cochico Fabric Textile Company, I guess they called it. And the women organized the strike because the new owners of the mill had said that uh, they were going to cut the wages by 5% of just the women. Mm -hmm. They're already getting hit. You know, they're not cutting your hours, they're just cutting your wages. So they went on strike, 1828. 
Well, there were so many more farm girls hovering around ready to take their jobs that the strike failed. And, you know, the girls either went back to work or went back to the farm. But what this was was a way of women learning to speak up for themselves, wasn't it? They're learning their civic voices. Mm -hmm. If we want change, we have to speak out. And that's what they were doing in the labor force. It wasn't until 1912 in the famous Bread and Roses strike in Lawrence and Lowell, Massachusetts, that uh, there was a real change in the working conditions of all these uh, laborers in the textile industry. But in that period of time, boy, the women were learning to speak for themselves. Mark, this photo was sent to me by a friend who moved to Ireland 10 years ago. Margaret Hinchy was an Irish immigrant. She worked in what we would now call one of the sweatshops in New York City, as did many immigrant women. And if the conditions were bad in those mills and Lowell and Lawrence and Dover, they were bad in the sweatshops too. So Margaret Hinchy was a survivor of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. In 1911, uh, this was in New York City. The, there was a textile factory. It caught fire. The doors had been locked for two reasons. One, so that the women wouldn't take unauthorized breaks, and also so labor organizers wouldn't get in and talk to the women. And so when it caught fire, the women couldn't get out. 146 people perished, most of them women. She was one of the survivors. And that made her... Um, move into the active labor organizing, as did many other women, and it brought them to the attention of some of the very wealthy suffragists who said, we have the same cause here. Women need their rights. In this case, they need safer working conditions, and we're going to work together. So it was a melding in the early 1900s of labor and the suffrage movement. I did start doing research on this, as I said, before COVID, and I took this picture down in Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian, and they had this wonderful exhibit that I saw just before COVID. This is one of two brightly painted wagons that they would drag around to these demonstrations that they were holding. And you can see it says up here, 8 million working women need the vote. Equal pay for equal work. There's a phrase we've heard before. Down here it says 90% of the teachers are women. The nation needs intelligent voters. Okay. And over here, it's hard to see. It's the women's journal they're selling for five cents a copy. So in addition to these demonstrations and the wagon and so on, they're publishing. They're publishing their argument, not only for women's suffrage, but for the other civil rights and for labor rights. Let's talk about how women's roles were changing. And I, I'll admit that these three women are exceptional cases, but they were well known by the public. And the public is starting to look at women a little differently. The girls are going to work in the mills and let's see what these women are doing. Annie Smith Peck was a mountaineer. She was the first person to climb Peru's highest peak. And a few years later, she went and posted this votes for women pennant on the top of one of the, the high mountains there. I wish we had that photo. And this is for the lady in back, Black in back, who was talking about the doctor book she just read. Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell was the first woman to attend a medical college in this country. They, they just would turn them down when they applied because there were women. Well, she had some medical training and she applied and there was this one college, Geneva Medical College, upstate New York, that said, you know, she's the most qualified of all the applicants we've got. <laughs> and so we're having a little trouble turning her down. So they got the bright idea of putting it up for a vote of the student body. Shall we admit a woman to the medical college? And the students, frankly, thought they were being pranked. And they also thought, wouldn't it be a hoot to have a woman in class and she'll faint at the sight of blood and so on? So they voted her in. Oh. 
I and, showed them. <laughs> and the college had to accept her, and she sure showed them. She graduated first in her class. She did not faint at the sight of blood. And that opened one of the professions to women. That was one of the claims early on, remember? Clara Barton had been a, an organized nursing force during the Civil War, and then afterwards founded the American Red Cross, modeled on what she'd seen in Europe. So here are individual women changing the way society is perceiving at least some women. We move a little bit later into the 1890s, the progressive era, and we meet people like Jane Addams. We would now call her a social service worker, uh, you know, but at that, I don't think they even invented the term then. So in Chicago, she bought a large property, called it Hall House, hired middle-class young women to work there, and then invited in all the poor women, the immigrant women from the neighborhood where they would learn sanitation. They'd learn English if they were immigrants. They'd learn to, to the information they need to become citizens, child care, sanitation, nutrition, all of this. This was replicated across the North. Eventually, there were about 400 of them, some of them founded by Black women in strictly Black neighborhoods but it was primarily in the North. So women were saying, if you won't help us improve our condition, we will help those who are even less fortunate than we are. Middle-class women started forming women's clubs with the intention of improving society and the General Federation of Women's Clubs founded in 1890 was doing that across the country in their communities volunteer work to improve the, the, the community. And in 1914, they officially joined the suffrage movement. Margaret Sanger is a bit of a controversial character, but what I will talk about here is that at the time of the, the let's say 1890 to 1910, uh, it was illegal to even discuss birth control. And so women were having these huge families, even the idea of what we now call the rhythm method was illegal to propagate, you know, publicly explain. Margaret Sanger defied the law. She imported um, diaphragms from Europe. She had teach, you know, classes where she would teach about the rhythm method because the belief that she held firmly to is that until you can control the size and timing of your family, you can't control your life. Mm -hmm. And how can you move out of that? She was arrested, of course, you know, but this gave many women the first glimmer that they had control. I'm going to talk about New Hampshire a bit. This is a New Hampshire Historical Society photo. This is a bunch of suffragists. And what do you notice about the, the people here? Couple of men. Yes, there are men here. And in the New Hampshire Society, the men often had the role of treasurer or secretary or whatever, or vice president. The women may have been president. Sometimes the men were president. But the this was never just a male versus female movement. Uh, there were women and men for suffrage and women and men on the opposite side. So let's see some other New Hampshire folks. Julia Rubley was from Cornish, a very wealthy woman. She was the Grand Marshal of the 1914 Big Suffrage Parade in D.C. Mabel Park Lakenden Churchill, also a Cornish, very wealthy woman. Her husband was Winston Churchill, but not the one we know. It was the <laughs> one who ran for governor. He was an author and so on. Uh, and she really founded the kind of Western New Hampshire suffrage organization. A little bit late coming, she did around 1909, but it was important for these wealthy women to, to have that role. You know Maxfield Parish, he and his wife were members of it. But I want to talk now about Armenia White. She and her husband, Nathaniel, lived in Concord, very wealthy family. They attended the 1868 Women's Rights Convention, turned to each other and say, we got to bring this back to New Hampshire. 
And so they founded the New Hampshire Women's Suffrage Association. And she served as its president almost until her passing, which was before the amendment was passed. Now, she not only did that, but she was an abolitionist. Their home was part of the uh, Underground Railway. But you see, she was also uh, president of the New Hampshire Women's Christian Temperance Union. So let's think about what's going on in, let's say, the 1870s, 1880s. Drink is very important to men. Rather than go home, they would go out after work. They would drink. They'd come home. Their money is gone. They beat their wives and their children. I'm sorry, gentlemen. I'm painting a broad brush. But it was such a problem that women across the country joined together and created the Women's Christian Temperance Union. They said, we, this is ruining our family lives. We've got to get rid of hard liquor. So you see the triple threat, and not just Armenia White, but many women were part of that. Abolition, suffrage, temperance. Now, a good friend of the Whites was Senator Henry Blair, U.S. Senator from New Hampshire. He was famous, and I'm very proud of him, for introducing in U.S. Senate 1886, the first proposal for a constitutional amendment granting women the right to vote, 1886. Now it went down in flames. <laughs> Two to one got voted down. It stopped right there. But it's our Senator Henry Blair who did that. <laughs> and now my favorite suffragist from New Hampshire is Marilla Marks Ricker, born in New Durham. She was one of those widows that I was talking about who inherited property. She married a much older man. He passed away. She was wealthy. She used her wealth to go and study the law. She became a lawyer in Washington, D.C. Uh, she, she took over you know, her husband's properties in Dover, New Hampshire. And she tried to vote first in 1870. Susan B. Anthony famously did it two years later. But Marilla Ricker tried it in 1870. She went to the polls in Dover and said, I'm a taxpayer. Yes, she was. Remember, she was that wealthy widow. I'm a property owner. I'm over 21, and I'm literate. Give me a ballot. <laughs> well, they didn't. <laughs> but she did that every year for the next 50 years. So I said she passed the bar exam. Uh, she was a lawyer in Washington. She, she wanted to apply to be a member of the bar in New Hampshire. And uh, they said, well, no, you can't do that. Why not? Because you're a woman. So she sued the New Hampshire Bar Association and won <laughs> and thus opened the New Hampshire Bar Association to women. She never practiced, but other women did. In 1910, we're 10 years before women can vote, she ran for governor. Why'd she do that? I have to read it to you word for word. Marilla said, I'm going to run for governor, although I have not the slightest idea of ever becoming governor. I'm running in order to get people into the habit of thinking of women as governors. You know, people have to think about a thing several centuries before they can <laughs> acclimated to the idea. I want to set the ball a rolling. Well, it was it was only 82 years, 86 years later that uh, we elected our first female governor, but she ran. Sadly, you know, with the the, the amendment became law in August of 1920, allowing women the right to vote. That November election was the first one in which most women could vote. Sadly, she had a stroke. She died just a few minutes after the, a few days after the election. It's very unlikely she cast a ballot. We can find no proof that she did, uh, but she knew that there were women across the country doing it. So in uh, 2015, 2016, New Hampshire Women's Bar Association and League of Women Voters teamed up to raise the funds to have her portrait painted. This is the unveiling. And the gentleman you see on the right over here is Representative Rennie Cushing, who passed away just a year and a half ago or so. 
he passed the legislation and you see uh, Governor Maggie Hassan pulling the cord for the unveiling. So next time you're at the State House, go see Marilla's portrait. Another New Hampshire suffragist, Sally Whittier Hovey of Portsmouth. She was allied with Alice Paul, and I'll talk more about her later, but just say for now, this was the more militant branch of the late <laughs> suffragists. So she, among other things, picketed the Republican convention in 1920 when they wouldn't put a platform in there for ratification. And no sooner did women get the right to vote than we've got an amendment for equal rights submitted to Congress and she's lobbying in DC. She was from Portsmouth. Uh, a league member in Nashua gave me this photo. That's her grandfather standing here in the front. Mm -hmm. Grandma is one of the two lovelies in the cab. This was a suffrage parade in Nashua. That's the famous bell tower there. The women all in white in the trucks as they're doing this suffrage parade. Isn't that great? Remember we said the first women to speak against uh, slavery were told to be quiet. That didn't last long. <laughs> <laughs> By the early 1900s, the suffragists were speaking in public. You see Reverend Dr. Anna Howard Shaw speaking, standing up in a car on Wall Street. But they also had formal presentations that an event like this would have been very popular and suffragists were speaking. By this fight, by, by let's say 1900, Stanton, Anthony are very old. Uh, Lucy Stone has passed away. People are getting tired of seeing the same old people. So who steps in but what we call the gilded suffragists? Mm -hmm. Those famously wealthy women from New York City. You know, it's the gilded age. Their husbands are fat, famously wealthy. And they decide to take up the cause of suffrage. This is one of them, Catherine Dewar McKay. Not only did she fight for suffrage and organize discussions about it, um, she was one of the founders of the women's clubs. Now you've heard of men's clubs, right? They were very popular. In New York City, the women said, we want ours. And the men said, what do you mean you want your own club? But anyway, they did. They built their own clubs at which they invited guest speakers. They had frank discussions about things like birth control, suffrage. Their daughters were going to college and coming home with radical ideas. They invited labor organizers to come and talk about the problems of women laborers. And so this is one of them. Let's look at another one. Alva Vanderbilt Belmont. Yes, she's one of those Vanderbilt. She had uh, gotten in her divorce settlement from Mr. Vanderbilt Marble House in Newport. Nowadays, we can buy a ticket and go through it. You know, <laughs> well, they didn't then. They were totally private residences. So she decided to open Marble House to the public on two consecutive weekends. You could buy a ticket for $5. If you put in today's money, it's about $135. And thousands and thousands of people wanted to see these houses that they had read about. And so they tramped through and the proceeds all went to suffrage, specifically Alice Paul's National Woman's Party. If it had just been those wealthy women doing something, that wouldn't have been too tremendous. But by then, the gossip columnists were focusing on what they were doing. So these women were in the newspaper all the time. Every one of their fundraisers for suffrage was talked about and ordinary people would read about it. So they organized a parade for suffrage in New York City. The first one was in 1910. Now these are women who rarely walked farther than from their, their house to their carriage to their friend's dining room, right? But they're gonna march down Fifth Avenue or wherever. This famous photo is from their 1912 parade with that littlest suffragist down here. <laughs> it's just beautiful. And so these wealthy women are again attracting attention and raising the profile of women's suffrage. One of the women who helped organize one of the New York parades, the 1917 one, was Mabel King Lee. 
born in China, college educated, PhD, and she organized Chinese American women to march in the parades. And when I get done, you'll see why I find this so poignant. I'll let, let it hang there for you. What else were women doing to draw attention to suffrage? Well, cars had been invented. Roads were terrible, but cars had been invented. And so the two women in the, in the top photo and their cat <laughs> made a five mile journey, a five, sorry, five month journey from the, the East Coast to the West Coast and back on another route, stopping in towns along the way to distribute suffrage literature and to give speeches about suffrage. Women were still relying on petitions for suffrage and they gathered them across the country, assembled the, for the delivery to Congress in Hyattsville, Maryland. And they made that last journey with these boxes and boxes of petitions in a caravan of 80 cars driven by women. Yes. So here is the, maybe the most stunning stunt they did. In November of, 20, of 1912, Woodrow Wilson had been elected president, first Democrat in almost two decades. In those days, the inauguration was held in March, not in January. So the day before Wilson's inauguration, the suffragists planned this big parade. And, you know, don't, don't be fooled. Yes, Woodrow Wilson was annoyed. Let's look at some <laughs> photos of the parade. I mean, he gets to the train station, you know, there's hardly anyone there to welcome him because they're all at the parade. <laughs> so they had this big pageant or tableau on the steps of the Treasury Building. Women came from across the country to march, um, you know, well-dressed, of course. They had women only in the parade. So these are women mounted horseback troops. There were four women only bands marching. They marched by groups. This is labeled homemakers and they have clearly made some kind of uniform for themselves. They marched as groups of teachers, as groups of librarians, as nurses. College students came and marched and you can tell that by the banner, the, uh, flower things that they're, they're carrying here. Uh, and there were many of them that came. There were between five and 10,000 people marching in this parade. What year was this again? This is 1913, March of 1913. Now, one of the sororities that wanted to march was Delta Sigma Theta from nearby Howard University, an all black college, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. all black sorority. And their advisor was a well-known, internationally known suffragist. Uh, she is very light-skinned, but she is of uh, Black heritage, uh, Mary Church Terrell. The organizers of the parade were worried about letting the college group march along with the other college groups for, for two reasons. One is that in 1913, New York, uh, Washington was a segregated city. So this was a problem. The other was if they made it an integrated parade, some of the white women might refuse to march. So at first they tried to ignore the black women that maybe they'll just go away and forget about it. And they tried to make them march at the back. Well, eventually they did march in the parade. Another black woman who was in the parade is Ida B. Wells, the journalist, the uh, anti-lynching journalist from Chicago. And she was the only black person with the Illinois Brigade that came and she fully expected to march with the Illinois Brigade. Um, this parade did have violence, all right? So the organizers were correct. There, there was gonna be, partly because the men there didn't want women to march. And second, it was integrated. Um, so for three hours, the parade was held up, it was just stalled until one of the suffragists got word to a relative of hers at nearby Fort Myer, and they brought the cavalry to clear the parade route. And so in the interim, Ida B. Wells had stepped out. They said, maybe you should march in with a black unit somewhere else in the parade. But then when the parade took off, she stepped right back in and she marched with the Illinois women where she belonged. 
So there was racial tension because there was racial tension in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were many black suffragists. So here's Woodrow Wilson. Poor Woodrow Wilson. Um, you know, his, his lovely wife, and he thinks he's going to have this lovely presidency, and before long, we're going to have a world war that he's dealing with, and he's got all these suffragists to cope with. And Woodrow Wilson was not opposed to women voting, but he was a Southerner born and raised, so he believed that if states wanted women to vote, they could grant them that. This should not be a federal issue. Now, we know even today, states have a lot of control over how elections are run. Mm -hmm. We do have to follow the US Constitution, but the procedures are states. And that was his position. It was a state's rights position. So let's talk about other reasons that people might have been opposed to suffrage. There was a formal organization. And guess who was the president of it? A name we locals know from the Fells. John Hay. John, not John Hay. John Hay was too mild mannered. No. His daughter, Alice. Right. Not the Alice who lived there, but daughter. Yeah. That was yeah. Alice. Yeah. 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 So daughter Alice was married to uh, U.S. Senator uh, Wadsworth from New York. And she became the president of the National Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage. So, yeah. Now, her sister, Helen was a suffragist. So I would have loved to be at one of their Thanksgiving dinners. <laughs> anyway, and let's, so was daughter. Yes, yes. So so let's talk about opposition. Why were people opposed to women's suffrage? Why was this so scary? Well, they'd cite the Bible, but you can no, cite the don't. Bible for anything. You know? The cult of domesticity. This we can blame on good old uh, uh, Josepha Hale from Newport. She published these magazines and these, she was an anti-suffragist. She said, women's place is in the home where they can nurture the next generation and develop their domestic skills. You know, she was all an that. early Phyllis Schlafly. Yes, she was, <laughs> exactly. Here are some other reasons. Women are mentally and emotionally unsuited <laughs> to vote. <Yeah. laughs> Politics is no place for a woman. Do you like the sign on the lower right? Mm -hmm. I took that picture in at that Smithsonian exhibit. And then there was a sign below it that says, um, that's okay, women are used to cleaning up after men. If the pool is dirty, we'll clean it. Like that. <laughs> women don't want the vote. Well, some didn't. That is true. There were women who didn't. Women are too busy. This one I can believe. The farmers said, if you give women the right to vote, the city women will be able to vote easily, but the farm women can't get to town because they're too busy on the farm. And so you will increase the city vote versus the farm vote. Mm -hmm. Think about that one. Mm -hmm. The liquor industry was opposed to suffrage because if women start voting, they'll vote for prohibition. Mm -hmm. Well, duh, yes, that's <laughs> what the whole temperance movement was about. But now I have to read something from a local newspaper down in Warner. My friend found us at the Warner, um, let's see, let's see, what's the name of the paper? The Kearsarge Independent and Times Weekly. And this is an editorial by Farmer Radford. So it starts giving this reason against women's right to vote. The home is the greatest contribution of women to the world, and the hearthstone is her throne. Our social structure is built around her, and social righteousness is in her charge. And he goes on in that mode for several <laughs> more lines. American chivalry should never permit her to bear the burdens of defending and maintaining government. Here's how he ends, though. But directing the affairs of government is not within woman's sphere, and political gossip would cause her to neglect the home, forget to mend our clothes, oh, and burn the biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> so there you got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. 
Obviously, the real reason behind this for government is that voting is a state's rights issue. So we have to keep coping with that. Meanwhile, women are working in the states to try to get state amendments to allow voting. And the big discussion in the early 1900s is, do we keep doing that and try to get one state at a time to let women vote, or do we concentrate on a federal constitutional amendment? And again, the women's movement is split between those believers. Mm -hmm. So this wonderful map shows when women could vote for president. Now, women had partial voting rights in many places. In New Hampshire, we got it in the 1880s to vote for school boards. Big deal. But anyway, we got it, as did, as did many, many states. But when you start talking about voting for state legislatures, Congress, and president, that's when things got messy. The blue state, I'm sorry, the gray states had full voting rights before they were even states. They, as they were still territories. The very first one was um, Wyoming in 1869. Now, why is that? Is that because men from Wyoming are just such nice guys? <laughs> probably not, it's probably another reason. And the reason most likely is that at that time, the proportion of men to women in Wyoming was six to one. And one legislator said publicly, if we give women the right to vote, Maybe some well-educated women from the East will move to Wyoming and become our school teachers and our librarians. And although he didn't say it, you can hear our thinking and our wives. Right. So there was a there were other reasons why the West was progressive, but that was that was uh, you know a big thing. It was the disproportion, and women who went there were hardy souls. So the blue states had full voting rights before the Nineteenth Amendment was passed. And where do you notice the gray and blue states are with just two little exceptions? They're out west. So the exceptions, well, we've got New York State, 1917, those wealthy women in New York finally got it. They, they got the vote in the state and Michigan. And yes, I know that part is Michigan too. I didn't draw the map. <laughs> there was a lot of dispute about whether the Upper Peninsula was part of Michigan at the time. So that's as far as I can go. I've tried to nail this down more than that. So those are the states who had full voting rights before 1920. The um, green states had some voting rights. They could vote for their state legislature, but probably not Congress, not the president, and so on. But the orange states, like New Hampshire, we have to wait for the 19th Amendment. Isn't that a fascinating map? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Meanwhile, the war comes, World War I. What happens? The men go off to war, their jobs have to be filled. And these women who are too delicate to vote <laughs> <laughs> will now go and take over those jobs. The YWCA provided safe housing, the Red Cross recruited nurses. Women were even being recruited to work the land army as they called it, work the farms, but what? until the boys come back. Mm -hmm. This was always thought to be just temporary. Wow. Some of the women didn't think of it that way, but that was the poster. Look at the work they did. They worked in the mines. They worked in industry. Oops. Um, obviously, they were sewing flags by the thousands at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in this photo. The munitions industry was the single largest employer of women in 1918. They were making all the bombs and bullets. They were doing heavy industry. Now, they were, you see them here in work uniforms. They'd never go out on the streets like this. Uh, but they're working in the shipyards on the railroads. Look at this close-up of women working in a stealing ordnance company. These are the delicate flowers you should be <laughs> They assumed roles like streetcar conductors, police officers, and when you see women marching in formation in uniform, you think of them differently. And that's what was happening. This was changing the public's perception, the National League for Women's Service. In France, the women were not only driving the, the um, ambulances, they were repairing them when they broke down. 
the wonderful book called The Hello Girls about uh, American college students who, of course, are bilingual in French and English being recruited as telephone operators for the Allied forces. And there's a lot of, we had a program here at the library about that. Did anybody see that? No. Uh, yeah. About they thought they were in the in the army, in the army signal corps. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a woman going around New Hampshire presenting that program called the Hello Girls. It's a book and a documentary. Now the Navy obviously recruited women because somebody figured out that they had eleven thousand women in the Navy in World War One. Someone figured out that a Navy yeoman, which means a clerk didn't have to be a young man, that women could take over the clerical duties and free the men to go on the ships and fight the war. Meanwhile, back at home, women are still lobbying Congress, trying to get the federal amendment passed. Demonstrations are going on. They're bugging um, the president and Congress. And Carrie Chapman Cat comes along and says, we've got to get enough states have voting rights in order to ratify an amendment that goes through. So she united the, the movement by focusing on those two fronts sort of dependently on each other. And here is Alice Paul. This is a name you probably know. She lived until 1977, I think. She was young at this time, you know, well-educated. She'd gone to England. She met the Pankhursts in England. These are the militant suffragettes. And you, you're hearing my using that word for the first time tonight. In this country, they weren't suffragettes, they were suffragists. The suffragette term was coined by a British newspaper trying to diminish the efforts of those women in England. But just as black men sometimes have appropriated the N word that we would not use, um, the suffragettes in England appropriated that term suffragette for themselves. They were very militant, they were violent. They blew up railroads. They tried to set fire to the prime minister's house, all kinds of things. Well, Alice Paul knew them. She was a good Quaker girl. She wasn't about to do any of that when she came back, but she did adopt the philosophy that the party in power must be held accountable. So after four years, Woodrow Wilson had done not a darn thing for suffrage, and she's going to see him defeated. And so she organizes an anti-Woodrow Wilson campaign. This is what he saw on one of his parades, campaign parades. So you can tell Alice Paul and Woodrow Wilson were not friends at all. <laughs> In fact, she started pickets in front of the White House. They were called silent sentinels. They stood there wearing their sashes, holding banners six days a week. Now that was fine and good until we actually entered World War I in April of 1917. Uh, and then it was considered unpatriotic. Mm -hmm. So you can see on the right how unpatriotic it gets. Oh, Kaiser. Kaiser Wilson, you know, you're fighting in Europe for the freedom of those people, what about the 20 million Americans who want freedom? There was violence then on these picket lines and uh, spectators came and tore at the women's clothes and destroyed their banners and threw things at them. So there were arrests, not of the people who were doing the violence, they were arresting the suffragists. They caused the trouble. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right and threw them into Occoquan Workhouse in Virginia. This was so filthy and vermin infested it had been closed. They opened it to house the suffragists. Lucy Burns is that kind of second in command to Alice Paul, you see a photo of her in the prison. There was forced feeding going on, not as bad as we've heard in England, uh, but Alice Paul was in, in prison over different periods of time, a total of seven months. Did she let that stop her? No. 
So finally, she burns Woodrow Wilson in effigy. Now, doesn't that sound dramatic? Until you read more and you find out it's a two foot tall paper doll and a pile of his speeches. But <laughs> uh, we're burning it in front of the White House. So, of course, I think that led to a 65 women arrested in that. By now, the war is over. And Woodrow Wilson has to realize that the war would not have been won without women's efforts on the home front and overseas. What the suffragists want is for Wilson to use the power of the bully pulpit to convince Congress to pass the amendment. And finally, he does. And so the House passed it, the Senate's reluctant, he tries again. Finally, we have both the House and Senate having passed the amendment in June of 1919. Now, all we need are 36 state legislatures to ratify it. So it goes to the states, and we're, New Hampshire is the 16th to ratify it. Every time the state ratifies it, Alice Paul sews a new flag on her party's banner here. And we get to the spring of 1920, and we have 35 states. We need 36. Vermont and Connecticut did not ratify it because they're stuck, sorry, their governors, I'll be nice, their governors <laughs> refused to call a special session. They were only meeting every other year in those times. So we're out of luck. We got 35 states, what's left but South? And where are states' rights? Strong argument in the South and the racial issue. So you see the sign over here, for a meeting in the Ryman Auditorium, yes, the Grand Old Opry, to save the South from the Susan B. Anthony Amendment and those whole images of reconstruction of people forcing this down their throats. But Tennessee is the one state where there might be a chance in the South of getting this ratified. July and August of 1920, the suffragists descend on the state as do the anti-suffragists. And these are some of the uh, statue in, uh, in uh, the park there. Uh, so they're getting, they're down there to try to convince one by one, convince the legislators to ratify the 19th Amendment and make women's voting the law of the land. Their emblem was a yellow rose. The anti-suffragists had red roses. So if they could sweet talk a legislator into going along with their position, they'd tuck a little rosebud in his lapel. It was pretty easy to count votes, wasn't it, that way? Uh, but they were doing serious vote counting. It passed the House, I'm sorry, passed the Senate in Tennessee, now it has to pass the House. On the very last day of debate, it looks like it's going to be a tie. And as you know, in government, I does not win. So young Harry Byrne, the youngest of the state representatives, is handed a note on the floor of the legislature on that last day. It's from his mother. <laughs> and it says, Yay, Mom. Hurrah, and vote for suffrage. Don't keep them in doubt. And she closes with, don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Carrie Chapman Cat. Now, Harry Byrne had thought to be a no vote. Maybe he'd been seen with a red rose, we're not sure. But they thought he was going to vote no, and that would have created a tie. As the roll call is made, Harry Byrne votes yes. Pandemonium breaks out. One other legislator who had been abstaining up until then, I guess, found the courage and he voted yes. And basically, the amendment passed. Now, the next day, Harry Byrne is asked, uh, comes back for some formalities and speaks on the floor of the House and says, I voted for suffrage because it was the right thing to do and because it's always good for a boy to listen to his mother. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the amendment. 
ratified in Tennessee on August 18th. It became the law of the land when the U.S. Secretary of State signed it on August 26th, 1920, almost 103 years ago. So what do we have then? Well, we've got the first election coming up in which women can vote. Eight million women cast ballots out of a possible 20 million in the country. It's not a huge turnout, but the Southern states made it almost impossible. They said, you missed the registration deadline, so you can't vote. There were all these other complications. They're still doing that. Yes, <laughs> yes. You know, the technicality is still coming. But women took this responsibility seriously. There's always been a fight for the civic voices, and now they're going to use them. And you see these old newspaper photos of women going to the polls. They had to learn how to do this. Um, the researcher you had last, last week, uh, last month, Jenna Carroll from Keene, found this fascinating fact that when some of the women there were registering in Keene in 1920, they had to answer questions like, what's your name? And they'd say, Mrs. John Anderson, oh. because that's the way you did it. You didn't say Susan Ann, did you? They didn't like that. Then, then the registrars would say, and how old are you? And they'd say, what do you mean, how old are you? And they also had literacy tests at that time. And so the women, one woman was handed a literacy test and she looked at the young man and said, Young man, I was your third grade teacher. Of course I can read. <laughs> <laughs> so women had to kind of learn how to do those things to register. And that's when the League of Women Voters was born. Every state that ratified the, Consti the, uh, the constitutional amendment was allowed to change its name from National American Woman Suffrage Association to League of Women Voters with the goal of helping people understand the mechanics of voting that I just showed was not easy, uh, and also to learn to study issues so women could vote from a position of knowledge. So that's why we celebrate our centennial at exactly the same time. Here in New Hampshire, two women instantly ran for office. They missed the filing deadline. Remember, it was ratified in August. But they had to run as write-ins. One was a Republican, one was a Democrat. They both won. So we immediately had two women in our state legislature. And then we had a woman senator 10 years later. But who was not voting in 1920? Well, Native Americans. Remember they got all started, the Haudenosaunee? They didn't get full citizenship until 1924. So they were not voting. Chinese-born immigrants like Mabel Lee, who had organized the parade, they didn't get citizenship until 1943. In the South, Black men had been harassed, intimidated, and tricked out of their vote for decades. Black women were facing the same problem in the South. It wasn't until President Johnson signed the 1965 Voting Rights Agreement that there was teeth behind enforcing voting rights for Blacks. And of course, we're old enough, many of us, to remember that 18, 19, and 20 year olds couldn't vote until 1971. There were many people still who couldn't vote coming all the way up to 71. By the 1960s, more women than men were voting, and that still holds true. And uh, they, we, we vote differently from men. We've heard of soccer moms, you know, and NASCAR dads, and so on. Different voting philosophies. So what became of the suffragists? Well, Harry Chapman's cat, Cats organization became the League of Women Voters. We still do that kind of nonpartisan work. Alice Paul's National Woman's Party started right away trying to get an Equal Rights Amendment passed. And as you know, it has not yet been passed. And the anti-suffragists, like Alice Hay, uh, they kind of dissolved. <laughs> But they kept up anti-communist, anti-labor, anti-progressive. You know, they, they were they liked being anti. <laughs> this wonderful photo from January of 2013 is after the 2012 election, when New Hampshire became the first nation ever in the country to have an all-female congressional delegation, and we elected a female governor. So that's Governor Maggie House here, and of course Congresswoman. 
Carol Shea, uh, Anna, Anna Custer, Custer and Carol Shea Porter, and Senators Kelly Ayotte and Jean Shaheen. And this was the cover of the New York Times when they all got installed in office. And 100 years after the 19th Amendment, our first woman vice president, Pamela Harris. And that is where I will start. Here, here, here. I'm happy to take questions or comments if you have any. Yes, we'll be out. Yeah, it's 20 up. We'll, we'll, we'll be done. I'll just take a couple of questions if you have any. I know we've got another event coming in here.